It was the English that had been in support of the Indians' ability to maintain a homeland. They were the ones who were trying to prevent settlement. The English were the rational people to side with. The Americans, on the other hand, were the people invading their country that were taking their game and taking their land. At the time of the revolution, the Eastern American Indian was hardly a mute primitive. He often spoke four or more languages, including French, English, and Iroquois. Joseph Brandt epitomizes the cross-cultural mixing that's going on in the American frontier at that time. While he is an Iroquois Indian, he is also a Freemason. While he is one of the principal leaders of the Iroquois League, he also has been to London and visited the king. Joseph Brandt and his loyalist colleague, Colonel Guy Johnson, together would launch some of the most vicious raids of the war. And likewise, their allies would receive some of the most violent retribution. While Brandt and Johnson raided in New York's beautiful Mohawk Valley, John Butler's loyalists and Indians raided valleys in western Pennsylvania. After the so-called Wyoming Valley Massacre, Butler claimed 227 scalps while losing only three men of his own. In 1779 in New Jersey, General Washington learned of these raids and ordered the country of the Iroquois Confederacy to be invaded with total destruction of their settlements. It became pretty obvious pretty quickly that the most efficient way of dealing with frontier situations was to have an overwhelming body of men march into the region and physically destroy the communities, the crops, and literally kill as many of the Indians they could get their hands on. He embarked on a policy that would continue for years. Soon the Mohawk word for President of the United States would translate as burner of villages. Probably one of the most famous of these sort of anti-Indian campaigns was conducted by General Sullivan. He marched north along the Susquehanna River Valley in Pennsylvania into what is now New York and systematically destroyed all the Iroquois habitations in that part of the country. Early in Sullivan's campaign, the American forces met the combined Indian and Loyalist forces of Joseph Brandt, Guy Johnson, and Walter Butler. Nathan Davis remembered the encounter. They commenced a fire behind every tree and at the same time gave the war whoop. Not all the infernals of the Prince of Darkness could they have been let loose from the bottomless pit would have borne any comparison to these demons of the forest. Nathan Davis. Sullivan's superior numbers and artillery soon routed the Indian and Loyalist fighters. Later in the day, one of Sullivan's riflemen found some of the Indians they had killed. He skinned two of them from their hips down for bootlegs. One pair for the Major, the other for myself, Lieutenant William Barton. The Indians were certainly capable of similar atrocities. Although Sullivan's main force received little more opposition for the rest of the campaign, two of his riflemen that Indians managed to capture were brutally tortured. We found they was both stripped naked and their heads cut off. And the flesh of Lieutenant Boyd's head was entirely taken off and his eyes punched out. Hercules Beatty. With drums and fifes announcing Sullivan's approach, Indians would abandon their villages before his army arrived. They had this very distorted view that Indians were savages, uh, they were dirty, they were lazy. This is particularly poignant when Sullivan's men um, arrive at the Iroquois villages. A number of them are amazed to find that, in fact, they're very well-organized communities. They live in log cabins. They find a number of very large apple orchards growing, very well-cultivated gardens, and in some cases, even domesticated animals. 
By the end of his expedition, Sullivan had destroyed over 40 Indian villages and broken the political alliance known as the Iroquois Confederacy forever. The American Revolution for the Native Americans does not effectively end. It bleeds into another war that becomes a war simply to maintain enough ground to live on. This war continues on um, until the very end of the 18th century, until America can effectively claim everything east of the Mississippi River.